Thank you for joining our COVID-19 webinar series. The webinar will be starting shortly. Please enjoy some of our pictures from our health centers and health center controlled networks. We'll be starting the webinar shortly. During today's webinar, we want to hear from you. So please use your phone and scan in this QR code to link you into our chat box where we're going to have an interactive session. The webinar will be starting shortly. We'll give it about five or 10 more minutes before we start preparing communities COVID-19, session number eight, the patient experience. Please join us in viewing some of our pictures from our health center. While we're waiting for the webinar to start, please join us in our word cloud. Who am I checking in on or connecting with today? Take out your cell phone and type in 22333 and put in COVID-19 heroes and add your name of who you are checking in with today. The webinar will be starting shortly. We will be starting a webinar in just a moment, preparing communities, COVID-19 session eight, patient experience. Please join us in looking at some of the pictures from many health centers that have been working on COVID-19. The webinar will be starting shortly.
The webinar will be starting shortly, but before the webinar starts, please join us in our interactive word cloud. Take out your cell phone and type in 22333, put in COVID-19 heroes, and answer the question, who am I checking in on or connecting with today? This is our interactive word cloud. Please join us and the webinar will be starting shortly. So good afternoon and good morning. Today, preparing communities, COVID-19 session number eight, patient experience. We wanna thank you all for joining today's webinar hosted by Health Choice Network and Alliance Chicago. Today, we're gonna to hear about the patient experience. So hopefully as we have more attendees continue to join the webinar, you'll be able to join us in our interactive portion. As we move forward into today's slide deck, we will hear from a number of health centers today, all about the patient experience. And as we wanna thank our community healthcare partners, our healthcare heroes, our healthcare staff, taking care of patients across hundreds and hundreds of health centers and many, many different locations of care. Today's webinar, session number eight, is all about the patient experience. And with the patient experience, we want to hear some voices from the patient, but then also we'll hear from health center staff who are talking to us about their patient's experience. So as we start today's webinar, we're going to hear first from the national level, from our CEO at Alliance Chicago and also the CEO from Health Choice Network. Both Fred and Alex will give us words about how we're doing on today's session number eight, and then looking forward into what's coming next. But most importantly, we wanna hear from our health centers. The voice of the health center is so important to us. And so today we have chosen the voice of the patient, the patient experience. So we're gonna hear from a number of health centers. You can see the health centers listed here, and we will hear from their experience through their eyes and ears of how patients have been experiencing the last couple of months during this COVID-19 period. So as we turn to our CEOs, first we will hear from Dr. Fred Rockman from Alliance Chicago. Fred, are you with us? I am, Tim, can you hear me? Yes, Fred. Great. Well, once again, welcome to all of you across the country, and thanks again so much for taking time out today to join us. We really value the opportunity to share stories, challenges, insights, and solutions. 
we have really rapidly converged over the last few weeks as a learning community. This uh, ability for us to harness the power that's available to us when we work together as a system is the original intent behind the Health Center Controlled Network movement. And it's really inspiring to me personally to see this uh, exercised in the way we have. Just as the rapid learning and insights we've gained has opportunity to help us evolve lasting improvements in how we engage patients and deliver care, once we're out of the acute response to the pandemic, we hope that this experience of what we can do together through the network relationships has created new connections and will inspire us to push the envelope of the network concept. Next week, Alex and I want to reflect with you on this experience and potential. So we hope that you will plan to join us next week again, along with HCCN and PCA partners for that discussion. But meanwhile, this week, again, as Tim said, we wanna look at things from the perspective of our patients and consumers. As challenging as the pandemic has been for us as healthcare providers and deliverers of care, it's truly heart-wrenching as well as inspirational to understand how it looks from their perspectives. We can't hope to be truly responsive and effective unless we begin to understand their realities. So uh, excited for today's session and back to you, Tim. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Rockman, Brad. Appreciate those words. And we're looking forward to session number nine, talking about networks connecting health centers. And next, we're gonna hear from the CEO of Health Choice Network, Alex Romeo. Alex, are you with us today? Good afternoon, Tim, can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Perfect. So aloha, good morning, good afternoon to all. I know we're, we're spanning the globe here with all our health center partners. On behalf of the amazing health center CEOs that make up the board of directors here at Health Choice Network, we want to thank you for joining us on our eighth webinar series. I am so grateful uh, today just to hear from the patients, from here from our health centers, and putting all your experiences and expertise to practice during these difficult times. Uh, you are much more than our heroes here at Health Choice Network. Uh, as I was reflecting on the patient experience, you know, I, I was looking at the 22 years that I've been serving health centers proudly, uh, also being a patient and advocate at a health center. Uh, I love to tell your story. I love to hear all the amazing work that's been done. But as I look at uh, myself as an employee of over 63 health centers here at the Health Center Control Network, the compassion demonstrated by the staff as you serve your communities out in the blazing heat, dreadful rain, and of course, I'm just talking about Miami at this point, uh, and handling the, the exhaustion uh, that uh, is required to be able to serve both new and existing patients in your community uh, has been just um, phenomenal. Uh, I will tell you as a volunteer as well, that I did help on the volunteer, those long lines of patients being nervous as they drive up, walk up, uh, commute uh, to your facilities uh, with a sense of unknowing, and the fact that your organization has looked at best practices, uh, learned from each other, lessons learned, uh, and allowing that patient to walk away with a great experience is, is why we're doing this webinar today. And finally, as a health center control network, uh, where they're celebrating our 26th year this year, uh, we were architected, designed, and built by health centers. And as we look at our mission, which is to serve and support the needs of our health centers, uh, I can tell you it's, we never planned or architected or designed for this type of pandemic, but we've learned a lot. And as Fred mentioned, uh, we're excited next week on the webinar series number nine to share that experience. Not only what we did well, what we learned, but we, what we got wrong and what we have to get better on how we can strengthen our partnership through the support of not only health centers, uh, but our primary care association partners, our, our uh, uh, supply chain partners, our national partners at the Bureau, uh, and at the National Association of Community Health Centers. So I just want to say thank you. Huge appreciation uh, from us here at Health Choice Network for everything you're doing and continue to do uh, without the right supply, without the right funding, uh, and you continue to be there uh, for the patients you serve, which I think those of us that have been in the movement so this long didn't expect anything less. So Dr. Long, I hand it back to you, and again, to all the great panelists and patients today. Great, thank you, Alex. We thank Health Choice Network and Alliance Chicago for hosting these weekly webinar series on COVID-19 and connecting health centers across the country and listening to each other's voices. So we have a great lineup of health centers today talking about the patient experience. And first, we're gonna hear from a health center called Crossing Healthcare. 
Dr. Sherba, are you here with us? Yes, I am, Dr. Long. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Great, great. So um, I am Tricia Serba. I am the uh, Associate Medical Director here at Crossing Healthcare in Decatur, Illinois. I'm also a uh, pediatrician. And um, just a little bit um, to tell you a little bit about Crossing Healthcare, um, if I could have the next slide. Um, Crossing Healthcare serves Decatur and Macon County, Illinois. Um, we opened approximately 45 years ago, and at that point we're known as the Community Health Improvement Clinic, or CHIC Clinic, and we uh, provided primary and preventative healthcare services to Decatur and the surrounding area. Approximately five years ago, we expanded and rebranded into Crossing Healthcare, and at that point um, re really expanded services to provide um, uh, care, primary care at the uh, Oasis Day Center, which is our homeless shelter. Uh, we provide an ER diversion urgent care clinic at one of the local hospitals. And we also staff the uh, STI clinic at our local health department. Approximately two years ago, we uh, took over providing health care at the Macon County Jail. And a year ago, um, expanded um, our services again through a mobile health service uh, with the Decatur Public School System as well as um, opening a, a comprehensive substance use disorder treatment and transitional housing uh, program to help um, in, the, uh, in the war against substance use disorders locally here in central Illinois. At present, we have approximately 200 employees at Crossing Healthcare. And in, in 2019, we had approximately 72,000 total patient visits and served about 17 and a half thousand unique patients. Um, next slide. So to, to give a very brief and quick overview of the Crossing Healthcare's telehealth timeline, um, uh, as you can see from the dates on the slide, um, it, it happened very quickly here at Crossing Healthcare, um, really in about the space of 10 to 14 days. Um, we uh, went from, uh, on, on Friday the 13th, <laughs> the ominous day that it was, um, recognizing that we needed to offer a telehealth platform um, to our patients as the COVID pandemic um, was ramping up and uh, becoming a reality for us here in Central Illinois. Um, the following Monday on March 16th, uh, we did a, a video uh, vendor demonstration and on that same day signed a contract with that uh, telehealth video vendor uh, to uh, get uh, access to a mobile app-based uh, video um, platform that we could use for uh, video telehealth visits for our patient. Um, very quickly that week, we uh, ramped up those uh, capabilities. And on Friday, uh, March 20th, we did our first pilot telehealth video visit and proud to say it was successful. Um, we then used the next week, uh, the week of March 23rd, uh, to onboard all uh, providers, uh, which we're, we're about 20 providers in our in our clinics, um, on the video um, platform, and all providers uh, by the end of the week of March 23rd were able to complete successfully their first video visits. And also that week, we concurrently um, launched our uh, telehealth telephone visits, which was in keeping with uh, what was allowed in the, by the state of Illinois. Uh, to date, we have. Uh, now provided uh, nearly 870 telehealth visits um, in the last two months. So today, uh, to explain part of the patient experience that we've had here at Crossing Healthcare, I have uh, the parent of one of my patients. Um, her name is Debbie and her daughter is Ella. And um, Debbie, I was wondering if you could um, just kind of briefly tell us a little bit about yourself and Ella. and um, how long you've been coming to Crossing, and, and what do you like about coming to the health center? Okay, and thank you for having me, all of you. I appreciate it, and I'm happy to help out. Um, I am <laughs> the mother of a almost 18-year-old with Down syndrome. I had her when I was 43, so um, old, tired mom here. <laughs> but I have been bringing her to Crossings for about two years, um, she had a pediatrician that stopped taking the Medicaid card, so we um, switched to crossing. And I have to say also, listening to your description, Dr. Sir, but I have actually watched this, um, the 45 years of 
transitioning from Chick Clinic to what it is today. And it is just, it's a fabulous facility. I've been so impressed. Um, I have been to the other clinics over the years, and it's just so much uh, larger, cleaner. Uh, it's huge. The waiting area is amazing. I, I can remember being just crammed in to some of the smaller spaces in the past, but the waiting areas, even pre-COVID, um, was large enough where I didn't feel, you know, like I was sitting in the ER next to a, you know, very sick <laughs> person right next to me. So it's, but post-COVID, it's even better. I mean, I don't even think there's been more than two patients the couple of times we've been there. I really uh, appreciate the accessibility as far as I've worked with disabled people most of my career. And I like seeing that the staff is incredibly friendly, professional, and helpful, both when I call with questions or in person for visits. The uh, return call, if I need to leave a message, is usually, if not that day, early the next day, as soon as possible, either the nurse or Dr. Serba will call me back. Um, Good. And uh, so, yeah. so before COVID nineteen, it sounds like your visits were 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 positive, but they were all in person, correct? They were they were all in person, and they were routine. I yeah, just routine physical once a year, pretty much. But yes, they were routine and friendly and fast then as well. You know, I didn't have any. Um, I've always had a positive visit. Good. And so yeah. can you tell us a little bit about the circumstances that led to your video telehealth visit with me? Yes. I Ella's, I said Ella is turning 18. And in the world of developmental disabilities, a, a child turning 18 has to, um, the parent has to get guardianship of the child. They can become their own guardians if that's not done and not done in a timely manner, you know, through the court system. So it, due to some other circumstances, the part of the petition to the guardianship um, judge is that the doctor has to sign off that she, in fact, has this disability and it will be, you know, long term, what have you. So I had to get that uh, in-person visit with Dr. Serba prior to her normal annual visit. And it had to be done, Ella's birthday is June 7th, and I couldn't get an appointment in the clinic before the very end of May, which would have been putting it very, very close. And my attorney wasn't happy about that with me, but we were going to try to make it work. And Dr. Serba called to suggest this, I guess it was late April, because I think we had our first tele, our tele um, conference on the first part of May which is in plenty of time to get the petition to the attorney. So that was the circumstances I had. It was very timely, timely situation. I had to get it done. <clears throat> right. I don't, right. And we were yeah. able to, to also fulfill the face-to-face -face requirements electronically Correct. to, to, uh, to, uh, to make the, the court system um, to meet their needs. Correct. Um, did you have any technology challenges with our visit? Out no, I really didn't. Um, I do teleconferences a lot with my work, and it, this was probably by far the easiest. The instructions were easy, how to get into the system. The um, So I downloaded it onto you know, the app or whatever I, have, uh, I had to do. And then the, I think I got a call just you know shortly before the time of our call or visit. And so everything just happened the way it was supposed to and the way it was explained to me that it would. So Great. Yeah, it went very positive. Now, how did you feel? And, and maybe you can also say a little bit how how Ella felt during during the visit. Do you think she felt connected to the visit? And oh, to yeah. Me? Oh, yeah. I think she was very excited because she knows that I do these kinds of things at my job. So I kind of explained it to her that way. And she was, yeah, I think she was very happy to, and excited to see you and um, be part of that process. And it was very comfortable. It was it, it really no different than being in the office other than, you know, maybe a, a positive thing I thought about was that I had a little bit more of a comfortable feeling that I could, you know, think through questions that I had as they came to me. And I didn't, it didn't appear to be rushed to either of us, but I think we both had a very um, positive experience speaking with you that day. And Good. I did too, as a matter of fact. Good. Thank you. <laughs> um, do you feel like you are receiving the same quality of care during the telehealth visit? Yeah, 
absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, I can't see this ever for these types of visits that don't need to be in person. I don't, I don't know why we would ever go back to the old way. I, I think it's very uh, positive and, and probably the wave of the future. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. That. Yeah. Lastly, was there anything that you feel like you missed out on compared to an in-person visit? No, not really. Um, no. I just, why would I miss waiting in the waiting room? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I thought it was uh, superb. I mean, I didn't have any negative feelings about it. And I really liked uh, doing it. And if we don't have to come in for anything, I would prefer to do it that way. Good, good. Thank you. So you mm -hmm. would plan, you would be open then to the future if there was a way we could figure out and determine a way to incorporate these types of visits going forward? Yeah, I would prefer that. It's, yeah, especially if I'm still working because that's always been really hard to um, schedule into my day. So good. Um, good. Yeah. Well, very good. Well, I really appreciate your insight and your information mm -hmm. today, and um, and thank you very much for uh, for participating with us this afternoon. Thank you for having me, and thank all of you for for what you're doing, and for all of your um, you're all the heroes here. So thank you very much. All right, thank you. Have okay. a nice day. You too. Thanks. Okay. Bye bye. bye, -bye. All right. So I think uh, I think that is uh, Debbie's uh, vision on this, and uh, I guess I turn it back now to Dr. Long. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Sherva. We so appreciate you. We appreciate Debbie. We appreciate Ella, and hopefully we, as a healthcare community and community community health centers across the country, can rise to her expectations and continue to deliver the quality of healthcare that you are delivering now. So more to come. You heard her voice, and we really appreciate Debbie. So please thank her for us. Absolutely, I will. Thank you. So next, we're going to hear from another health center in Illinois, a health center that's very dear to my heart, Near North Health Service Corporation. And it's where I have seen patients for over 23 years. And so I have the pleasure of introducing a close colleague of mine, DJ. And he is going to talk to us about, through his words and then also through mine, the patient experience of a small cohort of patients at Near North Health Service Corporation in Chicago. So DJ, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you guys. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. So good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everybody. My name is Dewan Rivers-White. I do go by DJ. I am the EIS or Early Intervention Services Program Manager here at Near North Health Service Corporation. Um, the patient cohort that I'll be talking to you about today are our HIV patient, positive patients cohort. Um, there'll be some data and some information here to kind of talk about their experiences with the transition from the traditional form of medicine to a telehealth platform. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so here on this slide, as you can kind of see, um, our patient cohort is a little bit extensive. So we have some males who are the majority of our population. They actually account for about 76% of our patient population here. Our women are 44% of the population. I'm sorry, at 44 are 21.3% of our population. Our transgender population, which is a smaller, thinnest, fuchsia-colored um, item that you see on this particular demographic, they account for 1% of our population at two. And then our youth and young adults are the brighter teal color. Um, there are five patients in that cohort. They account for 2.4% of our population. So we kind of have an extensive overview of a vast array of a great experience of what community looks like. Next slide, please. And again, those patients in that same cohort, this is just a demographic breakdown of what they look like. The majority of our patients, almost 83% of them are African-American, um, about 9.7% are white. The Hispanic population is about 7.2% of our population, and our Asian and Pacific Islander population is 0.5%. All right, next slide, please. So from talking to our patients and experiencing these encounters and helping to move along what this transition looks like for this particular cohort of patients, a couple of things have come from that. Um, so a lot of things have been positive for the most part, as we've seen the experience. The very first thing is the greater ease of access for our patients and being able to access their medical providers. They enjoy the aspect of being able to have both a video conferencing appointment where they can still have that face-to-face -face interaction or just a phone call if they're busy on the go or unable to do so. 
Um, we've also implemented a practice of an expedited or quicker registration process so that once our patients are contacted for their pre-visit appointment to confirm their appointment and convey any concerns to their healthcare provider, at that time, we also are conducting and completing the registration process for them. It decreases the amount of time that they're having to speak to multiple bodies, but also increases the ability to get in and out of those calls at a much faster rate. Of course, most patients feel safe and secure, especially during this time, because they have the convenience of being located in their home, as opposed to having to continually come back and forth throughout the health centers and risk possible exposure to COVID. And we talked about that, particularly for these patients as they are HIV positive, having the safety and the luxury of a telehealth platform does allow their HIV serial status to be a little bit more um, protected. Again, they are not in the midst of having to have conversations in and around other people who may or may not be aware of their serial status. So again, it's a helping to maintain their confidentiality and protect their rights. Um, again, de decreased appointment wait time. So with the telehealth platform, it actually is stays within that 15 minute time frame. And so we're getting a lot more closer. A lot more people are being able to be seen. There isn't as much lag time through the traditional models that we've seen presently where people kind of come in and out of the health centers. And lastly, for some of our patients, um, it's important to them to still be able to show their provider if they have any ailments or any concerns. They're absolutely able to do that through the telehealth platform. And so they still are able to show them rashes or breakouts or blemishes or things that they have concerns with on or around their bodies to kind of expedite how their care is being conducted. Also, another pro that we've seen that has come from this is that we tend to be able to want to give more information. So we're having better conversations, longer conversations. They are more engaged. They're actually <laughs> harder to get off of the phone and get out of the presence now that we've moved to an electronic platform than they are in the physical platform. So we're seeing those things. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so um, as we also have all of these positive aspects, there are also some negative aspects to anything. Um, the first thing that our patients have talked about specifically is because we are utilizing a application to utilize our telehealth platform services at this time, the biggest drawback for a lot of patients is that they have to download the app to be able to utilize the video conferencing feature. Um, so, so some people, it's great and they have it already and it's easy to facilitate. For a lot of maybe our elderly patients or some other people who may or may not have phone issues or access or some people who absolutely just do not have access to internet capabilities or phone services, that could be an issue for them. Another kind of drawback that we've experienced that people have talked about is they're not able to obtain lab work um, at the, so at the time of their telehealth visit, as they have done traditionally in the past, been able to do all of those things in one setting. Um, now they have to make an additional trip to the health center to be able to do those things. What we have done, though, and noticed is that if labs are ordered early, it kind of expedites the process. But again, it's a slighter inconvenience to that process. For those of, of our health sites who offer auxiliary services, specifically our podiatry, dental, and ophthalmology services, at this time, they're unable to access those things for COVID-19 precautions, although some of them have more heightened health issues or concerns where they would actually need a little bit more consistent engagement with those services. For some individuals, we have noticed and they've expressed that they are not really in the most confined or private or secure locations. And so we're finding ourselves having to move between some mixed appointments of missed appointments and mixed rescheduling of appointments due to lack of incorrect or outdated information, lack of privacy, um, and maintaining confidentiality purposes. Another thing that we have noticed as a result of this I've been told is that many patients are under the misperception that their provider, who is Dr. Long, is no longer here with, at noon, near north with us. So we're having to have those conversations to educate misinformation in the community to inform them that we have moved to a telehealth platform and not necessarily remove the program and the provider in its entirety. Again, as I said, our older patients have a little bit more difficulty navigating through technological advances, so it takes a little bit more time to get them acclimated to utilize the platform. And then the last piece that we have discovered in this piece is that as we have maneuvered, and maneuvered through these things, our patient literacy and health education platforms kind of times have been a little minimized. So what we have learned to do is increase the access of our auxiliary support staff here to be able to fill in those gaps as that 15 minute window of time is very, very critical. Next slide, please.
and I'll hand it to Dr. Yeah, I'll jump in here for just one second, DJ, and thank you for those comments. I'll turn it back to you. So um, again, yeah, as DJ mentioned, my name's uh, Tim Long, and I've been a provider you know, for many, many years. And one of the concerns that I had was that my patients wouldn't feel as connected to me. With some of these people, I've seen them for over 20 years. So connection was extremely important. And the long history um, with patients was, was really helpful, I think, once making that transition to telehealth. So I built up a relationship with these people, um, having um, more than just a, a patient interaction. Some people I see, you know, five, six times a year for 20 years, that's a lot. So that made the transition pretty uh, easy to telehealth, but most people did want to have the video telehealth because they did want to see my face and also see um, our care team members' face. Patients commented so many times on how they felt connected to the health center and to me during this period. Um, there was some misconception about not seeing uh, patients in person. And so they really felt actually quite connected when we reached out to them to say, let's set up a telehealth visit and we'd ideally like the video enabled visit. And patients were able to take their visit surprisingly to me, uh, some were at work. So some one person was a security guard and she just left her desk there and walked to another uh, private location, but she was really on the job. Um, there was another one of my patients who works outside um, and he took the job from outside. He actually cuts wood at a wood shopping place. Um, so people did not have to come into the health center and they all commented on how they appreciated that and that really saved their time. One thing that I did not expect was other family members of some of my senior patients also joined in on the video enabled telehealth visit. So I was able to see sons and daughters along with their uh, elderly parents, um, and we were able to communicate much more effectively um, than just having the individual patient, my, some of my senior patients, in the examining room. I now had th uh, three individuals, two of the children and the adults on, on the video-enabled telehealth visit, and that was, uh, um, we've done a number of them in the past two months with that family. Um, we saved him from going to the emergency room and being admitted to the hospital a number of times. And then I think patients have voiced, and I also might, might be some of my uh, bias too, um, the video enabled are much better than the telephonic. And I think the individuals who chose the telephonic are just the individuals who maybe their phone um, had a challenge downloading the app that we we're using in the past, as now we're moving into doxy.me, the download will not be um, an issue. So I think it'll be even improved more. And I think one last point to comment, um, with DJ and our team, we work very tightly. And we've put um, at least one of our care team members on each video conference call with me. So I and the patient and a care team are always on um, all together. And then after the call is done, the care team member stays on the video conference with the patient to go over any discharge instru instructions or answer any questions. So um, I have gotten such positive feedback. I think one of our goals that DJ and I will be working on over the next coming months is to try and get some objective information from some surveys. So DJ, I'm going to turn it back to you for the last slide on the summary. Thank you, Dr. Long. So just to wrap up, um, as Dr. Long and I have both stated, overall our experience and our patient experience with the telehealth platform transition has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, the major thing is that our patients are excited that they still are able to receive the same level of care with the provider that they've come to know and trust and that they can't, they have learned that these things are still accessible to them. So that was definitely important. It was definitely a positive aspect. Again, we're continuing to make adjustments to our patients as well as our staff as we continue, as we move towards the next stage of transitioning platforms to move towards doxy.me. So it will be another learning curve for both our patient population as well as our staff. Again, we have various levels of comfort with technology. So some of our more senior patients are now being supported by other members and or supported by our support staff here who will walk them through and guide them through how to utilize the telehealth platforms. They will work with them to do test and runs prior to their actual scheduled telehealth appointment with Dr. Long. So those things have been working for it. And again, and overall, surprisingly and overwhelmingly, we've seen an actual increase in our number of re retention and patient appointments as people are utilizing telehealth and finding it to be more convenient and more conducive to their day-to-day -day lives, they're not necessarily having to convert or change their lives to fit around their appointments. Now these can something that can simply fit into their everyday lives 
their everyday aspects, as Dr. Long has stated, while people are at work or at school or even on the go, they're actually able to take these appointments, get the questions, ask information, and continue to move on. So overall, we have seen a positive increase in outcome as it relates to telehealth. Our patients have expressed those things. We're grateful that we're able to provide this service, and I thank you for your time, and I turn it back to you, Dr. Long. All right, thank you, DJ, and thank you, Near North, for sharing the patient experience um, with that group of patients. So as we turn to our next health center, we're going to hear from a health center in the middle of the country, People's Community Health, and we're going to hear from Dr. Sharon Duclos and her partners uh, in Iowa. Dr. Duclos, are you with us? I am here. <laughs> it is so good to hear your voice. And I'm so happy to see you on TV on MSNBC. I cannot tell you. You are <laughs> my personal hero, Sharon. All right. Well, um, you know, a lot of what I'm going to say is uh, is definitely redundant as far as what people have seen uh, with the um, with the telehealth. Uh, so for those of you that don't know us, um, our clinic, we have about uh, 19,000 uh, patients um, and a, uh, a variety of uh, pediatricians, uh, family practice, internal medicine. We also have behavioral health um, and a lot of, of course, ancillary services like most organizations have. So uh, we, like everybody else, began uh, using the telehealth uh, once the pandemic started. Um, and um, have had really good success with it. Um, uh, for us, the biggest bugaboos are getting people set up. We use Zoom, that's what we're using. And so it's getting them set up on the Zoom so we can um, have the visit. Um, we do all the, we change our registration. Now everybody, whether they have to come into the clinic or not, we do a pre-registration. Um, and then we have somebody else that's just dedicated to setting up the telehealth visit, um, doing all the IT stuff to make sure that they're set up, trying to um, have them practice it once before the visit occurs. Um, so we have all that uh, happening by the time the visit happens. Uh, once the visit occurs, um, like if the patient was here in the office, um, the person who would normally room the patient gets on there first, gets gets the patient ready, goes through the medication checklist, um, asks all the questions that we normally ask, whether it's the prepare or the expert or um, whatever is due at that time, um, then that person uh, kind of gets everything ready. So by the time the provider gets on there, um, they're set up, the patient's ready, everything seems to be working well. Uh, one of the disadvantages is, is that, um, again, all of a sudden, you know, it was working well and now it's not working well. I've had one provider say there was a lag time in the um, in the uh, in the voice that you know where it, probably from the buffering your mouth would move or it would freeze, and so they had a more difficult time communicating with each other. So that was one of the negative things that we've seen uh, with the telehealth. Um, to me, the positives is, is you can definitely assess their home situation, and my patients have loved it, and that's what my other providers have said, too. And it is kind of, well, I've been here for a long time, so the, Dr. Long, I'm kind of like where you are. I mean, it's just like, you know, I feel like we're more friends, um, quote, having coffee, you know, as they're sitting at the table. Um, um, but uh, really sharing their story from within their house, um, and you can definitely see that, that comfort level. Um, medication review, we have all said, we've probably had the best medication reviews now because they can just hop right up, go to their cabinet and pull out those medicines because a lot of them, quote, forget to bring their medicines to the office, so you can't really kind of do the review. And then I can look on the bottles to see when they were last filled, um, you know, kind of get an idea if they've been taking them regularly or not. So that's definitely been a, a plus. Um, uh, family members, you're absolutely right about that, is, you know, once we start and we talk about the privacy, um, some of them want family members to be involved in the visit. Um, so we make sure that everybody is okay with that. Um, and we have not had issues of having to reschedule because of privacy. We, we kind of got all that to, um, uh, done right at the very beginning. Um, uh, so, but the family members um, really, uh, and especially with my elderly population, 
really given me some good ideas about how it truly is going at home and, and things that they may need um, um, to, you know, help with in the home setting. Um, so that's been the other uh, positive uh, thing also. Uh, concerning uh, our behavioral health, feedback from behavioral health, yet again, it has just been a very positive uh, they do feel like people are more comfortable um, in that home home scenario. Um, uh, it is amazing when you start to touch, when you really start to talk about, you know, those deep down feelings or, or things that are hard to discuss. Um, that is when I sometimes feel like it is the advantage for that person to kind of have that virtual wall. Um, so you have a little bit of distance. You can look away from the screen. I've noticed my patients, if we really start to talk about something that they're emotional about or something, um, I can, you can see them just looking away from the screen. They don't have to see me. Um, and um, they can kind of just, uh, you know, hide behind that and really kind of discuss feelings, which, which I think I've gotten better information. And that's kind of what my um, behavioral health uh, providers have also said. Um, so I've, I've met a lot of animals, um, cats, dogs, you know, fish, hamsters. Um, so they're <laughs> quite willing to share all that, which is really nice. Uh, because it is the uh, it's the other dynamic of your uh, patients uh, when you really kind of get to know their their support system. It's been uh, very very helpful for our um, uh, patients in the nursing homes. So much so that we we actually bought some um, iPads, and there have been a few of the nursing homes that have not had access, so we can do virtual visits. And I can tell you, a nursing home visit by phone, I don't think has been very helpful at all. That's been very difficult. So we, we actually took some of our iPads to some of the nursing homes so our patients could have access um, um, to the virtual visits. And not only in what we said is not only can they have access to the virtual visits, but they can also use this iPad to converse with their family because that's been a huge issue. And that's the uh, thing that I've noticed with a lot of my, my nursing home patients is just the increase in the, um, their, their, uh, just their mental well-being as far as the, the increase in depression and anxiety, you know, from this isolation has been very, very uh, tough. Um, our nutritionist, I think she would do them all virtually. Um, she has had so much fun having people at home because they can just walk right into that kitchen, open up the refrigerator, open up their cabinets, um, the pantries. Um, she she feels it's just so much more meaningful uh, when somebody is in their in their surroundings, when they can look in there and uh, see, yep, this is what I have been buying, this is what I'm purchasing, and then you can, you know, read that label together about what's actually in what they're purchasing. So she has has really really loved uh, doing these uh, virtual visits. Uh, um. Let me see. Oh, the other thing that we follow up on, and I think it's really important too, and um, other providers feel that way, you, you are doing a lot over uh, there as far as making your game plan about what you're going to do, whether you're changing a medicine, whether you are having them come in to do um, uh, lab work. Um, so on our visit summary, we're typing all that on the visit summary as, you, as you're going, but we're mailing that to the patients. Um, so hopefully in a day or two when they get it, then they can read it again. Um, and to, to us, we just feel like that's another great reminder of what that visit um, had been um, all about. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The other thing, they're they're quite comfortable in their home. I've had a couple of my patients just drop their drawers and and you know have me look at a rash, whether it's on their buttocks, if it was between their um, um, between their legs. Um, but they felt quite comfortable being able to position that camera in a way that I could see it. So I, I think that's a positive too that you feel that comfortable in your own home that you can uh, uh, do that. Uh, so that's been a positive uh, in that sense. Uh, we've been working really hard on trying to also get equipment into the home for our patients. Uh, so for our hypertensive patients, we've been, we, 
we work on getting one grant after another grant um, so we can purchase uh, blood pressure cuffs that we can give to our patients. So we recently got other grant monies that where uh, we just got 60 pulse oxes um, that we're going to start distributing to patients with chronic lung disease, and we're also going to use those for our COVID uh, patients so we can monitor them better at home. Um, we have purchased scales uh, to help people with congestive heart failure. Um, and then if you're really working on somebody with the weight loss, that would be a nice little addition to their house, too. Um, so you can have more of that in the home. Um, you're right about the disadvantage. If you need lab work, you need lab work. But, you know, then being able to talk the patient into saying, you know, when you come in, all you have to do, you make a quick right, lab is right there, you are just in and out. Um, and then we've made so many changes uh, in our health, you know, up front, like I'm sure everybody else has uh, concerning the show, social distancing that when they come in, I mean, it is pretty bare as far as the number of uh, people that are there and they can kind of feel that uh, right away when they come in and they have to get their lab work. So most of my patients, when I follow up in the labs, they're like, no, that was great. That was a piece of cake, not a problem. They were very reassured once they came in that they felt very safe to, to do so. Um, that is about it for us concerning the telehealth. So we are just so hoping we can continue this in the future um, to, to uh, continue doing these visits. Back to you, Tim. Great. I'll take it back, Sharon. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for everything you do, everything you do in Iowa. And um, I always look up to you and I love the experiences that you provide for us. So thank you for sharing. Oh, thank you. So here on our next slide, I wanna include everybody in our interactive portion of today's webinar number eight. We wanna hear from you. So if you can hold up your phone and hold up your camera on your phone and scan the QR code here, and what'll happen is, or click the link in the chat box, it's gonna take you to a, what's called a forms section. It's a little survey. We would love to hear from you. And we've designed some of these questions to help us at Health Choice Network and Alliance Chicago to improve some of the programming that we can do for health centers. So please take a moment during the rest of the webinar or even after to fill out that survey just by clicking on or scanning on the QR code here with your phone, or we'll put the link in the chat box and you can click that link and then fill out the survey throughout the rest of the webinar. So thanks, it's a little commercial for some of our interactive portion for today's webinar. So next we're gonna go to the beautiful state of Hawaii in West Hawaii Community Health Center. And we're gonna hear from our colleague, Chris, who's gonna talk to us about the patient experience in uh, Hawaii on the Big Island. So Chris, are you with us? Aloha, can you hear me? Perfectly. All right. Well, aloha everybody. Um, I, this is a, a privilege to be a part of this uh, this team, this huge group of, of, of network of health centers all doing the same thing, take care of our patients. Um, next slide, please. I wanted to take some time just to um, share our patient experience from different perspectives, focusing on um, telehealth, but also giving a piece of um, uh, different areas that we've been focusing on. Uh, just real brief, we are a um, health center, approximately 17,000 patients um, and growing five clinical sites. We have a 90 mile corridor that we um, take care of. You can see that on the map, the North and South Kona section there. Um, so it's a large area to cover, um, and um, I'll talk about that uh, as we move along as far as telehealth. Um, we have 20 medical providers, uh, 11 behavioral health staff, um, as well as all the other supportive staff. Uh, next slide. So uh, just really brief on the uh, kind of our stats in Hawaii, because it's very different than I think the rest of the country, and it's kind of interesting. Um, so we, I first want to apologize for everybody's Hawaiian vacations that got canceled uh, because of this thing. Um, uh, our governor shut down pretty much all flights to our islands, which has been huge in us being able to fight this thing. Um, we are now number one in the nation for, or, or top 1% for per capita for testing and mortality. 
Um, 90% of our cases have recovered in the state, um, and overall less than 3% positive rate statewide. Um, so we, we are kind of past the curve, flatten the curve um, in that uh, reopening phase right now. Um, and then the question is, what do we do next? Um, the one big bummer thing that we've got going on right now is one of the highest unemployment rates in the U.S. due to our loss of tourism. So we're greater than 35% unemployment when we were at 2% or less, I believe. Um, and that has been a large dynamic that we've had to deal with. Um, our response, we've opened, we opened a daily tri external triage tent to assess all symptomatic patients and ramped up telehealth um, through doxy.me, which I'll go into. Um, we restricted um, our high-risk patients to the clinic, but we remained open for face-to-face -face visits. And this was very important to us. As far as the patient experience, um, we, we wanted to be there for the patients and not just put up a, a, a wall and say, nope, sorry, only video. We can't see you. We have very careful screening on those that we would see inside the health center and would encourage them to stay home if they were high risk, um, but did not um, refrain from seeing them face to face. Um, we expanded some outreach services to our most vulnerable populations, which I'll talk about, and increased our marketing and digital outreach for our communities to improve um, our patient um, access. Next slide. So our priority to our patient experience has, has always been high for us. Um, we have a dedicated patient experience committee that meets um, on a regular basis, always figuring out ways that we can improve from physical space and now really to improve digital connections. Um, and so this season has really been no exception um, and actually has provided, I think that most of you have, have seen, um, unexpected opportunities, um, which will allow us to shine as, as uh, health centers in the future. Um, our focus has always been um, uh, kind of reframing our question to patients, you know, instead of what's the matter with that patient, it's what matters to the patient. And um, asking, reframing that kind of in a trauma-informed care way makes a huge difference in the patient experience as we walk through all of these areas. Uh, next slide. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about our external triage tent because I'm very proud of it. Um, and I know all of you have had different experiences, and our volume certainly is not as high as some of the urban areas that you guys have had to deal with that we've talked about in previous um, webinars. But we were the first on the island to start testing, um, and we made it a commitment that we would focus on patient experience. This has been obviously a very high, fearful, full of anxiety time um, for our patients, and we didn't want this to be a part of that. Um, I always go back to as a kid uh, in ET when those guys in the white suits walked into the house and uh, that was like the scariest moment in that movie and uh, we didn't want this to be a scary time for all patients and including pediatric patients um, so we have uh, dedicated BH staff um, behavioral staff in the tent at all times to help support patients um, through through the entire process and that has found be critical uh, for us um, and we have a full clinical staff from RNs, MAs, um, and the provider working with the patients. A key piece for us that we made a decision on is that we fully assess and examine all patients um, by a medical provider. We don't, we have, we chose not to do a drive-through test site, um, and I felt like that was really important. I feel like um, some of the drive-through testing that we did have on our island from other um, um, arenas, um, clinical things were missed. So patients with pneumonia, uh, for instance, um, and I think patients, the feedback that we got that they felt like they were a number, kind of in a, you know, cattle drive, and um, we have a personal uh, touch to each patient, and the feedback that we've gotten has been phenomenal and very appreciative. The community has really wrapped around us, and uh, it's been phenomenal to see that. Next slide. So telehealth, um, we, again, chose doxy.me. And we implemented that very rapidly, um, I think, as all of you have felt, flying the plane before we built it. Um, so it was a little crazy, but we have settled into this, um, this platform. It's very easy to use for patients, no downloads needed. Um, that being said, there certainly are still some issues. Um, we repurposed our dental staff as we just went to emergency services and care coordination team to reach out to patients to connect. And we have designated um, staff that are very tech savvy to do personalized assist, uh, technical assistance to support the less tech savvy patients. And I've, I've heard them on the phone. They'll spend a half hour with patients trying to figure out how to get them connected. Um, a very committed process, very patient with those who don't even you know, know how to enter an address into a web browser. Um, 
And so the feedback from our patients has been uh, very positive in regards to that. Um, we focused um, some efforts on connecting with our high-risk patients. We didn't want them to drop off the map, so we've been doing wellness calls to all our patients who, who no-showed and not rescheduled within three months um, and been able to pull them in through telemedicine. Um, we've also focused on our control, uncontrolled diabetics, and this week we started an A1C drive-up testing service um, where they can come in and put their finger out the window, get their A1C, and then we connect them with a telehealth visit um, uh, later in the week. Um, and then we also have a robust uh, MAT uh, program and a pain management provider, which um, they have been utilizing telehealth to those stable, lower risk patients and um, also have um, partnered with our uh, Precision Labs, who does our uh, drug testing confirmation, and uh, they are able to go to patients' homes and do oral drug testing so they do not have to come in for their uh, urine drug screens. Uh, next slide. Um, real brief with the telehealth, you know, we, we did a lot of education, a lot of pushing out of information to get people comfortable, but due to a lot of infrastructure issues here in that 90-mile corridor, there's a lot of um, um, blank spots as far as internet connectivity and a lot of social determinants of, of health, uh, low-income, uh, multi-generational um, households that have a very difficult time connecting. Um, and so we've had to revert to telephone calls for a lot of those patients. and those are getting paid, but only for the next uh, month. Um, and so we've got to figure out a transition for that. Um, telehealth for behavioral health, and I think most of you have discovered, has been phenomenal. Um, that has increased uh, drastically up to 60% telehealth with behavioral health, and uh, um, patients really love that flexibility with that. Next slide. I just wanted to touch briefly on marketing and digital outreach, as I feel like that's really an important piece um, for to bring patients in and realize that we're still here to take care of them um, and not be a kind of a silent hope that they come in type of situation. So we want it to be a source of grounded evidence-based information so that when patients wanted questions answered, they could come to us and not to the media where, uh, unfortunately, media likes to uh, err on the side of fear and uh, use that uh, to their advantage. And so um, we have been seen now as the source of, of accurate information where our patients can come and, and uh, know what to do next. And so we've used multiple platforms. We are connected with Solution Reach, um, which can do uh, send out text messages to patients, mass text messages or focused to based on um, different protocols, uh, media, uh, social media, radio and TV, and, and email. Next slide. Uh, I did want to touch on uh, community outreach because uh, the patient experience is a piece of this. Um, our most vulnerable populations, I think, get ignored, um, and especially during this time where there's limited resources. So specifically our homeless. So with that, 35% um, unemployment rates uh, came a very uh, quick uh, homeless uh, uh, increase, as well as um, some other areas were closed down, some housing um, were closed because they were private. And so we have a lot more on the street. So we've uh, had uh, ramped up our educational efforts and outreach, dispensing uh, hygiene kits and masks. Um, unfortunately, as our beaches closed, so did our public bathrooms, um, which has been a, a major problem um, uh, in the community. And luckily, as of today, our beaches are now back open. So um, hopefully that will no longer be the case. But we did partner with a local hotel and did some temporary housing for high risk um, patients along with the county um, who are homeless um, and then doing uh, care with them. Marshallese and uh, Micronesian populations, uh, I don't know how much everyone knows about the Marshall Islands, but they have a, a close connection with Hawaii um, and a lot of multi-generational living situations with subbar conditions. And so we've connected, we've already had deep relationships with them, but now we've connected even closer with them and um, given them resources, education, and access to testing. Um, where they're comfortable, where we have our triage tent open to them. We, we're playing their cultural music and, you know, making it kind of a relaxed environment to be able to get what they need. Um, and then we also have reached out to our farm workers, um, and uh, which are mostly Hispanic. So next slide. So looking ahead on um, where, wh what we, where we need to move to. Now, we're going to have, because of this unemployment rate that we have, um, it's going to be tough for our economy to re rebound. Um, it's going to be a while before we have flights open to Hawaii, and 
Um, we went from 30,000 people a day coming into Hawaii to 100, and those 100 are usually residents. And so um, to get our tourism back up and running is going to be a large, uh, a large undertaking safely. And so um, we're going to have a significant increase in uninsured and underinsured. And uh, the question is going to be, how do we reach these patients? How do we um, bring them into our health center? And, um, and so we're working on that right now. There also will be a significant increase in our Medicaid. And the question is, do we have capacity for that? Um, the, the, as far as telehealth is concerned, major connectivity issues, major infrastructure issues for our patients. And so how far do we push telehealth? How can we work on those infrastructure issues to connect them in a new way? Um, we are starting to see a decline in telehealth visits. I, um, the patients, when we're calling them and asking them for telehealth, they're like, no, I'm, I'm ready to get out of the house. I want to be seen. Um, we're in that open, you know, we're phase two, phase three opening, and so we're allowing patients to come in more. Um, and so there is a decline. So the question is, where is that line and how, how far do we push it? Um, and then, of course, that telehealth uh, disconnect. Um, how do we make it a better experience for the patient and have more clinical value for the provider? We're, we're looking into more home monitoring. We need uh, some uh, monies for that. Um, and we're going to look at more focused uh, patient surveys to get objective data on what to do uh, next to make this an even better experience long term. There is a place for telehealth. I absolutely agree with that. Um, but I think it, it, it can't replace our face-to-face -face visits where we get, you know, get to touch the patient and physical examination and such. So we've got to find that balance somewhere. So I'll stop there. I know I'm over my time. Um, I appreciate the time to talk, and uh, mahalo. Mahalo, Chris, and thank you very much for sharing your experience uh, from the big island of Hawaii. We appreciate it. And also, as soon as we start having in-person conferences, we will try to advocate to go to the beautiful beaches of Hawaii. Absolutely. Please come along. So as we move forward to our next uh, slide, I just want to put one plug in or in the chat, you will see the link again to our survey. Please help us get some information from you and get your experiences by looking in the chat, clicking on the link, and then you can fill out the survey while you're listening to the rest of the webinar. We hope that you're enjoying the webinar. And next, we're going to hear from another one of our partners in Illinois from Prime Care Health. Aaron and Marianne and Jim, are you guys all with us? Yes. Yep. Great. Take it away. We can hear you loudly and clearly. Great. Just waiting on those slides. Yeah, there's a little delay, so just say advance. Oh, five. no problem. Yep, there's, a, there's about a three-second delay. Thank you. Um, so my name is Erin Howes. On a normal day, I'm the Manager of Quality Improvement at Prime Care Community Health. Um, we are an FQHC in Chicago, serving about 22,000 patients a year through 70,000 visits. Um, but during this time, I was repurposed to sort of spearhead this telehealth project. Um, and like many of you have already said, and that I'm sure those of you listening have been through, we kind of had one very long weekend um, that probably would have taken us months and months to completely transform the way that we were delivering healthcare. Uh, we have never done this before, and we had to choose a platform, make all the workflows, and, and that led us to Doxy, uh, like some of you have mentioned. So our goal right from the beginning is what can this look like long term? So we were watching a lot of the insurances change their, um, you know, their plans and their statements and looking at HIPAA being more relaxed, but we wanted something that when this all ends, um, what was going to be sustainable for us. So we, you know, chose Doxy as the HIPAA compliant platform, and we were at 90% virtual visits within a week. Um, we have been able to maintain about 90 to 95% of our usual productivity through this time, which has been fantastic for our organization and for our patients. Um, and of course, a lot of this setup was the billing rules, the documentation rules, and using the EMR to kind of blend this new platform with what we already knew. So when you put the quality person in charge of telehealth, you're going to have to be data driven. So that's my one uh, semblance of my normal job. And so we have, um, you know, we built everything in the EMR that would allow us to track, um, which, uh, you know, led us to set a goal internally, right? So not only were we going to promote telehealth, but I wanted to track how many of these were going to be video visits. 
um, again, with the um, idea that this would be a long-term goal for prime care, and we had to move away from the phone um, and think about what this would look like in the long run, uh, especially with reimbursement and just better patient care. So we had to educate our staff, of course, inform our patients. Um, so we, the way that we wanted to educate our patients on all these changes and let them know that we were still here was through outreach. Uh, we did start, like some of you have mentioned, with high-risk groups, so thinking about our patients with diabetes and hypertension, COPD, asthma, and chronic heart failure as a start, and then also patients that would come in for, for regular uh, services that might be a nurse or MA visit, like contraception. So just reaching out to all those people and let them know what their care could look like now. And also to talk about, you know, we built into our templates the CDC recommendations and what their care would look like during COVID and how um, the, making sure that we assess their social determinants of health. Um, and finally, we did use um, the uh, EMR to do a lot of text campaigning, um, especially you know here in Illinois, very strict rules and a lot of updates that we were worried our patients um, wouldn't be aware of. So just anytime we heard something from the mayor of Chicago or our governor, making sure that they were notified. Um, so we are uh, in the next phase now where we're trying to move to 90% of virtual visits being video. And from an operations perspective, the patient experience significantly improved when we upgraded our Doxy platform. So any of you using Doxy know there are levels, anyone considering it, I highly recommend the upgrade. Being able to text our patients the direct link to see their provider was game changing. There's no app, no downloads. So that was, we've gotten a lot of good patient feedback there. And the MAs have had a great amount of responsibility in driving our telehealth process. Um, they're setting up all the video calls, troubleshooting. So they're, they're, we rely on them completely um, in terms of patient satisfaction and getting this going. So that's the background for prime care, um, but the people doing the really good work are the ones in direct patient care. So um, Marianne and Jim are gonna share some of their experiences on our move to telehealth and I'm gonna, They've been incredible advocates. So any of you with questions on the provider level, they do average 80% of their visits are on video. They both have had days of 100%. So I just have to shout them out. So I'm gonna pass it over to Marianne to share some of her best practices. Hi, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Marianne. I'm one of the nurse practitioners with Prime Care. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about how we set up our workflow specifically for our COVID-19 patients. Um, when we have patients that we either suspect or know have COVID-19, we're following them very closely with frequent telehealth visits, usually every one to three days based on their symptoms or the provider's discretion. Um, we're starting patients with a visit first with a provider and then we do have the capability then once they've seen one of our providers to send them for testing at two of our sites. And with regards to monitoring vital signs, that is obviously much more difficult with uh, video. Um, most of our patients don't even have access necessarily to a thermometer or pulse oximetry. So a big component has been really educating and stressing what are the symptoms to watch for at home and making sure that the patients understand what that decline looks like so they can contact us or even just go straight to the ER. Um, and again, in terms of treatment plan, patients are really anxious that there isn't a cure for this. And so in medications prescribed, making sure that we're making them comfortable at home and checking frequently. I think having the access for the video um, visits frequently has helped a lot of these patients feel less anxious. Um, you know, in a time where we don't really necessarily know how is the disease gonna progress for this particular patient, um, both for the provider and the patient feeling a little bit anxious, having that frequent check-in has been uh, really great for our COVID-19 patients. Next slide. In terms of our success and challenges, similar to some of what we've already heard, um, in our patient population, it has actually been able to remove a lot of barriers. We have patients that struggle to get to appointments because of transportation, having to get on multiple buses or childcare. Some of our patients have multiple jobs. And so being able to join um, a visit without even leaving their home or even as mentioned before at work has been a great experience for a lot of our patients. Um, and as mentioned as well, the benefit of having a visit at home, the patient's more comfortable. And as a PCP, being able to see into the patient's home and their environment um, is, is also a part of the intake with a patient and 
the family members that are able to help and assist has been great with our elderly population. We've had younger grandchildren helping set up the phones and, and being able to help explain a little bit for these patients. Um, and then again, the medication reconciliation, having them at home and having them pull all their meds out has been great. Um, with the EMR and our uh, platform, we're able to do digital education. We can share the screen with our patient and show them a video or pictures, uh, and particularly if you're having them use an inhaler that they've never used, I can split screen and share an actual video to show the patient during the visit. And so that's been a really great feature um, for us to have. And then with our EMR, we're able to, if we have them set up on our patient portal, we can send the visit summary to their patient portal for them to, to see right away. We can also send letters for work or referrals straight through our patient portal. So that's been great for us. Um, limitations or challenges, the connectivity, you know, internet connection, poor connection, both at our offices and with patients, you know, that's been a challenge for us. And as well as uh, standardization across a lot of new information, new technology, new workflows. And so trying to have all of our clinics on the same page has been a little bit challenging, but so slowly we're getting there. Um, so those are some of the uh, pros and cons with our telehealth experience. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm just gonna talk about a particular experience with a patient that I had that was positive for COVID-19. Um, this was a patient that was not previously a patient of ours at our clinic. A 31-year-old female was diagnosed in the ER, had a two-day follow-up in clinic, young with no com comorbidities. I started the visit and for the beginning of the visit, her sister was on the phone with her face and she was talking the whole time. Um, a patient I didn't know very well, so it was hard to know what her baseline would be normally. And, you know, in terms of the video, as soon as I asked to have the patient try talking and put the patient on the screen, I could tell right away that she wasn't doing well. She couldn't speak in full sentences. She was taking breaths as she was trying to talk to me. She looked pale. I could see that she was diaphoretic. And so th these are things that I wouldn't normally be able to tell with just a phone call. Um, so it really had the, you know, benefit of having that video for this patient. You know, I was able to tell her right away to go into the ER. Um, she ended up having pneumonia, needed oxygen. And so I don't think I would have been able to really be able to see that based on what they were describing to me just with a phone call. Um, and this patient then was set up with follow-up visits every two to three days with their providers to monitor her symptoms. So again, it just really highlighted the experience of, of having that actual face-to-face -face with a video. Um, and I, again, my patients are, are expressing that they really like having frequent check-ins. It helps with their anxiety um, in a time where there's a lot of unknown. And next slide. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Christopheridis. Yes, thank, thanks, Marianne. Uh, I'm Jim Christopheridis. I'm a practicing physician at Prime Care, also the chief medical officer. So I just wanted to, um, uh, I just want to talk about a couple, a couple other cases that highlight just how powerful uh, telehealth can be uh, for our patients in regards to access and, and care. I think we were all somewhat surprised at just how much we can do uh, using uh, use with telehealth. So I, I had a 41-year-old uh, female patient who had been complaining of blurry vision. Now, uh, she had been attempting to see a specialist, uh, an ophthalmologist, and she had been unsuccessful scheduling an appointment in, in any timely fashion. And pre-COVID, it might have taken a week or two for her to come see me. We were able to set up a visit a uh, video visit same day um, when I examined her, uh, she had an abducens nerve palsy, uh, palsy, which she wasn't able to turn her left eye outward. That was a, and so we were able to get her in to see a, a neuro ophthalmologist uh, within a week, which ordinarily would have taken months. Uh, and as it turns out, she was diagnosed with uh, with Graves ophthalmo uh, ophthalmopathy. So I think that it, it illustrates how we were able to expedite care in a way that we wouldn't, there's no way we, we would have been able to do otherwise. If we could move to the next slide, please. Oh, thank you. And 
in addition, it, it's been it's been a, a way for us to kind of re-engage with patients that haven't been able, uh, for whatever reason, uh, to come in and be seen. Uh, in this case, a, a two-year-old uh, that we had been having uh, difficulty uh, uh, reaching and, uh, and even getting for their routine well child visits, uh, the family reached out to us uh, after hours through our answering service, and the patient had you know, a cough and noisy breathing. And by using by doing a video visit again overnight, uh, we were able to see that the child was really working to breathe. Uh, patient he had uh, subcostal and intercostal retractions and with uh, a nasal flaring. Again, this is an overnight and after hours call. So, uh, of course, we instructed the patient to be seen at the, the, the Lurie Children's in Chicago, and you know he was able to be uh, uh, seen and discharged from the ER before he got worse uh, and diagnosed with new onset asthma. Again, it also allowed for us to uh, to uh, re-engage the, uh, the patient and their family in care. And uh, and since then, we've had several visits, and we're uh, we're optimistic we'll, we'll finally be able to get them in for the uh, uh, for the catch-up immunizations now. You know, our experience with telehealth was obviously driven by necessity, and you know we continue to learn and develop best practices, and are adjusting to this new normal. I think we've been surprised just how much we're able to do with it, with these visits. And moreover, we found that the majority of our patients really appreciate the convenience of the services. And uh, our next goal, and the one that we're working on, uh, is to make sure that this that, that this is sustainable for the future. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to present, and I'll turn it back to Dr. Long. Great. Thank you, Prime Care team, Aaron, Marianne, and Jim. Great work and excellent presentation. We really appreciate it. So as we turn to our next health center and our next slide, we're going to hear from a colleague here in Florida. And there's just a little bit of a delay in the slide, so that's okay. But Darren, I know you're up next, so let's give the slide just a second to catch up with us. And Dr. Thornton is going to talk to us about uh, the patient experience at Empower You. So Dr. Thornton, are you with us? Yeah, can you hear me, Dr. Long? Yes, yes I can. Go ahead, take right. it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys for having us. Um, yeah, I'm Darren Thornton. I'm the Chief Medical Officer here at Empower You. Uh, we're a small company compared to some of the other entities out there. Uh, we have right at 62 employees. We've been around since 1999 and uh, we were started by two HIV positive African American women uh, with the goal of bringing culturally relevant treatment to that population. Um, can I get the next slide please? All right. Um, no, let's see. I think there was another slide before that, or was it? All right, can you hear me? We can hear you. There might be just a delay on the slide. I think this might be the first slide, unfortunately, that we have. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so, Let's see here, give me one second. So yeah, all right, so we're, like I said, we have a very uh, small population and some of the factors that were taken into consideration uh, were that we do take care of a rather vulnerable population. We're the uh, 33147 uh, zip code and a lot of our patients are vulnerable in that they're on the lower end of the socioeconomic totem pole. Uh, a lot of our patients do, um, harbor immunosuppression, uh, not just considering the uh, population of HIV positive patients we serve, uh, but we also have the chronic conditions like any other FQHC would have, the blood pressures, the diabetes, the cholesterols, uh, the asthmas and the heart problems and et cetera. Um, and again, secondary to being a re relatively small company. And at the time when this started uh, kicking up, uh, when COVID really got on our radar. I'm going to be honest with you. I was any any one of the few people that may know me on here. I was in Daytona Beach Bike Week when COVID started popping up all over the place and uh that's when I realized it was serious. So right around March um I think Friday the 13th I was in Daytona and I was back in Miami on Monday. 
uh, that's when we knew we had to uh, make some changes as far as how are we going to deliver um, health care. Um, so those of you that started to, you know, that were obviously tuned in to, you know, paying attention to the COVID-19, um, you know, I learned this when I was an undergrad. It looks like the facts were never changing, but our interpretations of those facts were changing. Uh, I remember reading uh, what you should do when this first got on the radar of the United States. Uh, and then, you know, things have since changed and the information was, was changing. So uh, can I get the next sli slide, please? And yeah, I left out, you know, there was the, uh, there's the famous uh, hydroxychloroquine, uh, which apparently uh, is popular to take. I'm sure you guys are all taking it to hoard off the COVID-19. Um, uh, and then there's the remdesivir, uh, and that's administered through an IV drip and probably will not be administered in uh, our current healthcare setting. Uh, so what we looked at here at Empower You uh, were the risks versus the benefits. And due to the fact that we have a relatively small population compared to some of the larger entities, uh, we elected to enact strict universal precautions. Uh, we sent all of our non-essential employees to work entirely from home. Uh, the clinical staff stayed on site. Uh, behavioral health was allowed to work from home. Um, we went with joint care team, but it started to feel as if DoxyMe worked better for us as far as our transition to telehealth is concerned. Um, but as far as the employees coming into the office, uh, we took the approach that everybody had COVID-19. Uh, all employees were screened upon entry, whether it's temperature questionnaire, smell test, look test. Um, we forewent the community lunches. Uh, we used to have a rather large drug company presence on Fridays. We would do a lunch and learn seminar. Uh, one of the drug companies would come in and bring lunches for us, but we decided to not do community lunches because if our drug rep was remote, uh, we really said, you know what, we're not going to eat together if you can't be here with us. Um, so we also enacted strict social distancing when possible, masks and appropriate hygiene as always, uh, sanitizing, sterilizing. Uh, still, we, even though we elected not to outright test for COVID, uh, some COVID still managed to slip through the cracks uh, as the uh, myriad of symptoms had uh, had progressed. Uh, if you can't smell, we learned that's uh, probably not going to get you entry into our office. Uh, but uh, that this particular experience helped drive home just how important and um, to the staff that how serious this was and that uh, this was it, perhaps ubiquitous because you never knew where it was going to come from. Can we get the next slide, please? All right, so what we wanted to do was make sure our patients had somewhere to go. Uh, we maintained our office hours for patients that absolutely needed to come in uh, with a goal of moving from 100% face-to-face visits to 80% telehealth and with the remaining 20% being in person. Uh, our hours of operation, I personally see patients Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, Pre-COVID, we were going from, I would get in about eight, between eight and nine and I would see patients till 7 p.m. Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. Um, however, uh, post during and we're currently just working from nine to five. Um, ironically, we still managed to get quite a bit of an uptick in sexually transmitted infections. Um, we still got quite a bit of gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomonas syphilis, uh, and to the point where uh, the Department of Health also started to refer to us for STI testing and treatment, not just uh, HIV, which, uh, but they had curtail curtailed some of their services throughout the pandemic. So uh, as far as the contact exposures for the gonorrhea, the chlamydia, the trichomonas, and the syphilis, uh, they were referring to us for, for those purposes. Um, you know, I've had patients throughout the COVID, we had treated them for, let's say, syphilis, and then we had a titer of 1 to 64. Uh, by the time we uh, went through the treatment regimen for them and had them back after three weeks, uh, we had a titer of one to 128. So, you know, we've had to, we've had some challenges, uh, but, you know, we've since 
been able to deal with those. Uh, we also had uh, our chronic conditions, uh, as I mentioned, blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, HIV patients, uh, low risk, uh, and the patients that were doing what they were supposed to do, we had them come in via, well, had them seen via telehealth, uh, but there were pediatric patients and, you know, they were, you know, screened and everyone, you know, passed the screen and we were doing immunizations. We were still taking care of our obstetrical patients. Uh, some patients simply needed to come in. Some patients wanted to come in and get depot injections. Uh, we have a bit of, quite a bit of patients that are on psychiatric medications. We have quite a bit of a, a number of patients that wanted to get uh, injectable birth control. We, you know, and as, as I mentioned earlier, we had to, you know, administer quite a bit of bicillin. Um, so, you know, we managed to keep our doors open because at some point I missed one of my uh, bullet points here that the uh, hashtag stay at home was only going to last for so long. So we've been seeing that as far as some of the treatment and care that we've been administering here at Empower You. Uh, can we get the next slide, please? So what was our aim? Uh, our aim was to continue to operate and service our clients throughout the pandemic in a way that minimized the likelihood of us introducing COVID-19 into our facility, uh, co-workers' homes, and our patients' homes, all while not disrupting our clients' access to us. Uh, we are, have a unique location. We are in a strip mall that's known as uh, Northside Shopping Center or Flea Market. So we have a DMV office, which was closed down next to us, which uh, we've just entered into our uh, phase one of opening here in Miami. I think uh, the, the park across from my residence just opened this morning. Um, so we had to, you know, relay the message to our patients that we were still open. Uh, however, we just didn't want to increase the likelihood of introducing this into our small facility because it was a, if we did have a close contact, and we have had a couple of patients that were COVID positive, uh, whom since have recovered, uh, but we would run, given that we're only one facility, we would run the high likelihood of having to shut down in its entirety if we weren't very careful with that. Can we get the next slide, slide please? So what happened uh, for our behavioral health team, uh, which were supposed to be 100% uh, doing telehealth from home, uh, you know, one provider did maintain her visit rate at 100% telehealth. Uh, another provider was able to maintain 94.4% and the other provider was able to maintain 89%. So as far as our behavioral health team is concerned, uh, we were able to on about 94 and a half percent of all of those visits uh, were, were conducted via telehealth. Uh, as far as the medical provider team, uh, we were, were only four medical doctors. Uh, we had a visit rate of one of us was 61.5 percent, one of us was 44.3, the other was 56.1, the other was 53. 53 was me, uh, which we went about 53.7 percent uh, telehealth. Um, we did find that certain patients, particularly elderly patients and patients from lower socioeconomic stratosphere, um, which makes up a lot of our clientele, uh, prefer the telephone uh, for telehealth purposes. Um, and again, the reasons varied, uh, but we do have a, a, a touch of our population. One of our providers uh, ran a practice for many years on Miami Beach, so we do have some patients that come from uh, a higher um, socioeconomic stratosphere, uh, but the younger patients seem to be more uh, open to uh, the telehealth and, you know, more technologically advanced. So, you know, that's been a challenge for us. However, uh, we have noticed that we have garnered new patients through this process, uh, given that we were uh, still maintaining open uh, office hours. Um, so, let's see. And as things starting to open back up, pa uh, patients are more comfortable coming out. Uh, again, as someone else mentioned before me, that uh, people are anxious to get out of the house uh, and they find comfort in knowing that we were always here for them. Uh, today, for example, this morning, I saw nine patients, only one of them was telehealth. Um, and, you know, serving a smaller demographic, um, we have more of a more of a family environment here, but you know, I think we just uh, can we get the next slide, please? 
There we go. All right. And moving forward, I feel that we need to just continue to stay vigilant. Uh, always teach prevention uh, and education. So patients, coworkers, friends, and those that may not quite understand the level of severity, uh, as the sooner we realize we're all in this together, the sooner it is we'll be able to combat the spread. And thank you. That's all I have. Great. Thank you, Dr. Thornton. We really appreciate your perspective, um, the fact that you saw patients today and then came to tell us about that experience uh, this afternoon. So thank you. And hopefully you'll have many, many more years of bike riding up and down the Florida coast. Thank you. So next we're going to hear from a health center again in Florida, Miami Beach Community Health Center, and from a good colleague of mine, Dr. Torres, who every time he speaks, I learn something. So please uh, listen closely to Dr. Torres, because uh, I think the information he's going to share, um, we're going to learn something. So Johan, are you with us today? I am here. Um, thanks for that great endorsement. Now I feel like um, I have to live up to expectations. I'm going to take a different uh, tack from uh, what everyone else has been talking about so far today, and I hope that's all right. Um, this is I'm responding to the questions that I had, um, not to throw anyone under the bus, I'm just saying that I'm responding to questions that I, that I had been given. So it's not going to be so much about telehealth, although I'll comment this much on telehealth. There's already been a lot that's been said, um, and I have very little to add to what's already been spoken about. What we've had here at Miami Beach is essentially the same as what a lot of people are doing so if we have slightly different platform i will say that um you know we we've done a lot of telehealth visits we're, we're currently around 44 percent of our visits are telehealth we've done about 2700 telehealth visits since um, around the mid early early uh, the early april kind of late part of march for some of our providers we do have an entire team that um that does uh follow-up set up for the patient and then follow-up uh, meaning like try to get uh, uh, feedback on the patient experience and I polled that team this morning they all said that generally it's a good experience again what's already been said um, pa patients like not having the wait um, one of the team members actually said this which I think is new and interesting is that they felt like being able to access the doctors in this new way or the providers in this new way prevented them from having to go to urgent care so th I think that's a that's an interesting thing as far as the feedback uh, and patient experience of having telehealth available, which is a new way of accessing us. So my focus today is just really gonna be on COVID testing and the patient experience for COVID testing. Uh, briefly, because I know we're over time, um, at Miami Beach Community Health Center, we started testing on March 13th. We started tent-based uh, tent drive-up testing um, on that date uh, at two of our three physical locations. We have never required appointments, so patients would just drive call. Um, or show up and then we would uh, point them to the testing. So we, we have never done tests within the physical locations of the buildings. They're always done outside in tents as other people have said. We did um, have screening protocols. I will say that um, I felt like I was chasing the changes in CDC guidelines every single day um, to make like different uh, screening protocols. Uh, we I, In the first like three weeks of this pandemic, I think I changed it four times. We were in like version five by the time I stopped doing uh, guidelines because we changed that eventually, and I'll talk about that when I get to what we're currently doing. This was nurse-driven, so it was never really a provider visit unless the nurse felt like she was un he or she was uncomfortable um, with dealing with that patient, and then they, we, we would bring the providers in at that point. And we gave the nurses some pretty clear guidelines as to when the provider should be um, called. And when I say nurses, these are LPNs and RNs who are, who are doing that screening, who were doing that screening. We had two entry points so patients could call. We put it on our website. We put out a, a solution reach uh, campaign um, that said that we're offering free testing at our centers. Um, and then we received those phone calls and had um, uh, several of our nurses receive them and then um, decide whether the patient needed to be tested based on a protocol again, and then um, sent that to the testing teams. Um, also patients were identified at the entrance who said, I want to be tested. And again, and if they met certain criteria, we sent them. Um, all patients, again, patient experience uh, focused, all patients were recommended uh, for quarantine for 14 days, regardless of the result at that time. That was the initial couple of weeks. So currently, we are offering several types of tests. Uh, everyone knows that there's a PCR test, there's LabCorp Quest, and, and now we have the Abbott Rapid Test. We, pr we provide both drive-up and walk-up testing. So initially, we would, again, there's that issue with cars, but Miami's kind of a driving town anyway. Um, we never had issues with walk-ups. 
<clears throat> but now we're offering walk-up testing as well. We offer it at all three of our locations. Um, there is still no appointment needed. And any and what we're doing is basically any patient who wants a test gets a test. So there's no longer any screening protocol. Um, if they think they want to know, if they're curious, whatever, they will, will um, get them a test. Again, we're also testing outside. We're not doing any tests within the center regarding um, a PCR test. Whether or not they should be quarantined depends on <clears throat> what the result is and whether and the reason why they got tested. If there are risk factors, so we still do a questionnaire, we still assess the patient for um, vital signs like fever and uh, O2 sat. If there's a reason or suspicion that they might be um, that they might be uh, COVID positive, um, we will tell them to quarantine even if the result is negative. <clears throat> Um, obviously, all positive test results, even if they are not uh, uh, at risk, and we've had several of these, especially with a rapid test where the patient was absolutely well, had no risk factors, they were just curious and they end up getting a positive test, we tell them to quarantine. And then uh, no, more recently with antibody tests, which I'll just say one sentence on, and we're not really recommending it, but we have it available and we're, um, we're having that done by provider discretion. Um, no quarantine recommendations have been made as far as that is concerned. You can take go to the next slide. Um, so the patient follow-up, and I think that's the piece that was uh, relevant to this conversation today. All of our patients receive counseling at the point of care of testing. So again, those are nurses. We actually even have a doctor who's not practicing as a physician, but as a medical assistant. Um, they are there at the testing sites, giving the patient advice about um, COVID based on a protocol. We um, have handouts for all the patients. So we took the CDC handout that you see on the right side of the screen. This is actually the old handout, um, which we still like because it has a lot more information than the newer handout. If you look up uh, the link that I put on the, uh, on the presentation here, you'll see access to um, something similar with less information. It's more bullet points, 10 points that they put on there. And they have that available in English, Spanish, and uh, like three Asian languages. I, I think it's Korean, Vietnamese, and, and Chinese. Um, no other languages, unfortunately, but those are available at the CDC website. And it's similar to this. We are still using the old one because we like it better. All patients with a positive test result are called by an assigned medical provider from each site. Um, and uh, the risk factors, again, are described uh, to the patient. They, that, that provider calls them and discusses um, what to do if they get sicker, um, do temperature checks, vital signs checks, et cetera, um, and then just checks up on the patient to make sure that they're, they're um, doing well. We do, main, if you know us at all, you know that we maintain a large reg a registry of everything. So we had that available. We're constantly um, polling that uh, registry. We're constantly analyzing the registry. I won't get into that too much right now because again, time. So coming soon, things are in the works. We are thinking of doing tele telehealth visits for all our patients regardless, especially those with risk factors. In fact, we already do that. We don't do, um, that when the providers call, it's a phone call for most of the providers. In pediatrics, because it's a slightly um, you know, touchier group of patients, um, parents might have a little bit more anxiety than your average patient. So of course, we, we have turned that into telehealth visits. Um, uh, for 100% of pediatric patients. We're thinking about doing contact tracing since we have the capacity to do testing. So we, when we have a positive test result, we'll ask their contacts um, to come to us, I, not in the epidemiological sense, but something along those lines. We just don't have staff for that right now. And um, as everyone has heard, there's this uh, Kawasaki-like syndrome for pediatric patients. So most of our patients are only followed up uh, for a couple of weeks after their uh, positive test or a couple times after the positive test for pediatric patients. As we know, if we've heard on the news, this is probably a several weeks to even a couple of months follow up for those pediatric patients. Uh, that's still in the works and in conversation. You can go to the next slide. So I was asked to talk about this, which is a little bit of patient experience. I just want to do a warning, quick warning, that this, this uh, protocol or workflow is not based on any evidence whatsoever. It's completely the opinion of Miami Beach. So you can go to the next slide. The last thing I'm going to talk about today is so, so, somewhat patients because all, you know, when patients, when our coworkers get tested, they automatically are patients if they're not already users of the center. So any, this is our protocol for testing our coworkers. Any Miami Beach Community Health Center staff who gets tested um, by PCR is quarantined for 14 days regardless of their symptoms, regardless of why um, they got tested regardless of their um, you know their current health status we quarantine everybody it turns out this is the right choice 
We recently had a provider who tested negative um, when she was having symptoms and she tested antibody, this was months ago, uh, in the beginning, I think it was like the early part, like the 18th or 19th of March. Um, she recovered, she was quarantined for 14 days. Actually, she argued with me about the quarantine for that 14 days. It turns out she's antibody positive. Um, a IgG antibody positive, so she probably was infected, and that was probably a, uh, a false uh, negative at that time. Um, but we quarantined her anyway, just like we quarantined everybody. We have some uh, return to work um, uh, criteria, as you can see here, with their no fever, improvement in symptoms. This is a kind of based on what the CDC recommends, like a mishmash of the two options, which is symptom-based and test-based. We, we do require two negative tests, and, and knowing that there are, there's evidence that people are no longer infectious even if they test positive weeks out. We just have a lot of, a few of our providers, <clears throat> I'm sorry, a few of our staff who have tested even six weeks out of the initial um, infection, even though they have no symptoms and they have no fever for, for weeks and weeks at a time. We think it's a liability issue, um, you know, regardless of what the, what the literature says about their infectivity, if they are still testing positive and someone else in the clinic becomes positive, then we don't, we don't want to have that. So that's why we test them. And then we have a, a little bit of a retesting protocol because we found also if you, if you do test consecutively every day, you're going to potentially end up doing um, five tests in a row every day until they test negative, which we don't do. So we wait for, uh, I'm not going to go into details, but the upshot of that testing protocol, retesting protocol, is that we wait for the result first and then um, then we retest them again a second time to make sure they're negative. Any positive retest is, is, uh, is uh, we wait seven days before we get um, a new retest on them. We have been doing Abbott, but again, it, as you've all probably heard, there's some questions about a negative on an Abbott test. So now we have moved to retesting our, our staff only with the lab core test. Um, I hope that was useful. That's a little uh, deviation from what we've been talking about the rest of today. Um, and that's all I have. Great. Thank you, Dr. Torres. And that's exactly what we wanted to hear from today from you. Um, our coworkers are also our patients, and that's why we felt that this message was extremely important. That's why we wanted to end uh, with this message today. So thank you uh, and Miami Beach. And everyone should know the Miami Beach Community Health Center is one of the top, if not the top, community health center in the country. So thank you, Dr. Torres and Dr. Rubinowitz for your leadership there. So as we close out today's session eight on COVID-19, preparing communities for COVID, we wanna thank Alliance Chicago and Health Choice Network for all of the work that they have done to help put on uh, this series of webinars. And next Wednesday at the same time, we'll be hearing from a national perspective of health center controlled networks and PCAs across the country. And the CEOs of Health Choice Network and Alliance Chicago uh, we'll be hosting that series, so please join us. You'll be receiving a registration link soon, uh, so please share that uh, with everybody. And here, as we close out today's webinar, are some resources that you can download, share with anyone in your community health center or of your professional uh, colleagues. So again, we wanna thank you for joining today's webinar, uh, session number eight on patient experience. Thank all the panelists very much. We appreciate your time. We know this is taking you out of your day, and we appreciate everyone for listening in. So I hope everybody has a great day, and uh, smile, because we've got a lot of work to do in the future. Have a great day. Goodbye.